So welcome back. Um, what we'll do now is we'll take a look at the quiz, see how y'all did. Okay, so here's the quiz and there's an A and a B. So let's start with part A. So at 6 a.m. yesterday, the temperature outside was negative two degrees Celsius. And at 2.30 p.m., the temperature was 22 degrees Celsius. Then sometime between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m., the temperature was rising at an exact rate of three degrees Celsius per hour. All right, so we have to, as the instructors, instructions said before, prove each of the following. And we must explicitly name the theorem that you're using to write down the proof using complete sentences. Okay, so what theorem are we gonna be using to prove that the temperature was rising as exact rate of three? Yeah, this one's gonna be the mean value theorem. And just note, we had two main theorems on Wednesday, I mean, on Monday. Um, mean value theorem was one of them. And that says that the average rate of, that the, the derivative is equal to the slope of the tangent line between A and B, as long as you have a differentiable function. And that was the mean value theorem. And there was also Rolle's theorem that said that if f of a and f of b are the same, then the derivative is zero. And certainly, f of a was negative two, f of b was 22, and those are not the same. So no, so we need to look at a few things. First, notice that um, we have to decide, and this is, this is normal in applications, is you have to decide on a coordinate system. Okay, I purposely gave you one that was a little bit, a little bit challenging, but not evil or anything. So we have to decide on what the X coordinate system is gonna be because we're going from um, 2 p.m. to 6, uh, so we're going from 6 a.m. to 2 p.m. You can't just take two minus six, that doesn't work at all. So what's a good idea for a coordinate system? And there's a couple good choices. So use, yeah, let's use military time. Military time. And in that case, given military time, we know that F of, let's do this in pretty. So F of six was negative two. Any questions on that? Okay. And we know that F of, well, what is um, 2 p.m. military time? Yeah, 2 p.m. is, is 14, 1400. And I'm gonna drop the hundred. So I'm gonna use kind of military time because there's no reason for the hundreds. But if you want, you can do that, but I'd rather go for um, hours military time. So we know that F of 14 was equal to 22. Zero interest in this. Any questions on that? Okay, so the next thing we're gonna do is now we need to find the secant line. So now we look at f of b minus f of a over b minus a. And what that is was, well, f of b was 22. minus f of a was negative two over 14, because that's what b was, minus six. And 22 minus negative two is 24. 14 minus six is eight. So that's 24 over eight. 
which is equal, what do you know, three. Okay, it was not a trick question. Okay, there's one more thing you have to check before you can use a mean value theorem. And what is that? Any thoughts? Is it that it's differentiable throughout the whole uh, interval? Yep, we have to show that it's differentiable. So note that this is um, that the function is differentiable since differentiable last i since um, what would it mean? What would it mean for it not to be differentiable? Right? Physically, what would it mean? If you were standing outside, what would it mean if it was not differentiable? Yeah, there'd be a sudden jump in temperature, and that's not possible since temperature is always differentiable, okay, or cannot change. with a sudden jump. It may feel like it sometimes, but that doesn't happen, okay? Even if it feels like, man, it just went up five degrees. Um, it really went up five degrees in a half second maybe, but it was a differentiable change. Okay, so therefore, by the mean value theorem, there was a time between 6 a.m. and 2 p.m. when the temperature was rising, because rising is the derivative at exactly three degrees Per hour. Any questions on part A? Okay, let's go to part B. Okay, now we have a bird. So a bird flies from its nest that is 20 meters above the ground. After 10 minutes of flying, the bird lands on a branch on a faraway tree that is also 20 meters above the ground. Then sometime during those 10 minutes, the bird was neither rising, was neither gaining nor losing altitude. All right, what theorem are we gonna use here? Yeah, this one's gonna be Rolle's theorem. So let's use Rolle's theorem. So first, what we have to note is the F of, maybe I'll do it pretty. So we're gonna know that F of um, zero is 20 and so is F of 10. So let's put that in equation look style. So F of zero equals 20 and F of 10 is also equal to 20. So that means f of zero equals f of 10, because that's what you need. Any questions on that? Okay, so now, um, what else do you need for Rolle's theorem? that the, the derivative of both functions is equal? Um, yeah, there's only one function. No, um, not the derivative. Well, in, in, is equal. Okay, yeah. Not the derivative is equal. What do, you need, what do you need to know about the derivative? 
Yeah, we need to know the derivative exists. We need to know that it's differentiable. What would it mean for this function not to be differentiable? Well, what kind of bird would this be if it was not differentiable? Yeah, be a magician, <laughs> okay? A teleportation bird. And by the way, there is no such thing as a teleportation bird. <laughs> so um, since this is a bird, the, um, the uh, altitude function must be differentiable. As I mentioned before, when it comes to physics, when things, things are moving or changing temperature um, or doing anything physically, differentiability is never a problem, okay? Um, the only main case where, especially continuity is a big problem, you would know in, um, when you're dealing with engineering kind of physics stuff, on a day-to-day -day even, so I'm not talking black holes, no, no one when you when you don't have differentiability. In in kind of physical things, there's one main piece. Um, yeah, but that's like the weird. That's not the day to day stuff. Come on, day to day, you don't care about an electron. I I don't think. <laughs> so th this you actually do care day to day. I have, I have experienced it probably 10 times already this morning. No? Okay, electricity. Electricity. And that's because you turn the light on and off. And when you turn the light off, the voltage suddenly goes from, um, from something high to something zero, to zero or zero to something high. Um, it's a little more complicated than just electrons. I, I think I'm not gonna get into it. <laughs> But there are electrons involved, but it's a lot more complicated than that. Um, yeah, the electrons are not differential because of quantum physics. Electricity is not differential for different reasons. Okay, so anyhow, um, the idea is this is a bird, it's not an electron. Um, there's no problem, it's differentiable. So therefore, by Rolle's theorem, And yeah, you are responsible for citing the, the, the name of the theorem. I told you you had to. We can conclude that we know that f prime of zero equals, f prime equals zero for some c in between. So let's write this out. f prime of c equals zero. for some C between um, zero and 10 minutes. And that's what we're gonna need to show. And that means that at that time, there is no change in altitude. Any questions at all on A and B? It's kind of very different than other problems that you've had to do in the past. Because this is theory day, if you remember a couple of days ago. Any questions? Okay, if there's no questions, um, I want to go back to Q and A time. Is there any questions about anything? This is your chance. And I think it might be worth it while you're thinking about questions to remind you about something coming up in a few weeks. I'm gonna talk more about it on Friday, but I wanna just note one thing and and that is on December 2nd. So it's less than a month from now. 
there are going to be presentations. And just a reminder, I haven't talked about it since the first day of class, so it's time to talk about it a tiny bit now and then more later. Is you have to have a group of two or three per group. Okay, how do you find how do you find group members? Any ideas? Normally it'd be easy because you'd be in class and you just talk to each other and sit. Yeah, you could do it on Canvas. You could also do it right now. You could do it on chat. Okay, you could private chat or public chat either way. Hey, I need a, I need some, I need a group. Um, let you know that if there's three of you, then you'll have one third of the work to do. Whereas if there's two of you, you have half the work to do. So your life is easier if there's three of you. So just a note. Um, on Friday, I think I'm going to talk about the more of the details of the project. But right now, you can think about finding group members. You can finding partners. Okay, so I recommend three if you can do it, because um, you're going to have a presentation in less than a month. Okay, so I'm going to let you um, pop in the chat. You can also put it in the Q&A. There's a little Q&A that no one uses, but that might be a good place to use it. So that's just a note. So there's different ways. And then if you're really stuck, you can ask me and then I'll plead with you guys to you know, add somebody in. So that's just a real big note is that there are presentations that are going to be due and they happen on December 2nd. So kind of towards the end of the class. Okay, we still have a lot more going on. Um, the next exam is on the 20th, which is still a while from now because we just took an exam. But I figured I'd mention it. Okay, the next thing I want to do is I want to look at functions. And I want to look at graphs. And based on, based on graphs, and I just kind of grabbed a random graph. I want to look at this. I want to describe kind of in words what this graph is doing. So how, what's it, just in words, what is this graph doing at the very far left? If you were to kind of describe it to someone who doesn't know any calculus and not much math either, what would you say on the very far left? What do you think it's doing? How would you describe it? Any thoughts? Approaching infinity. Um, okay, it's approaching infinity on the far, on the left. Okay, but here's the here's what I want to think about. Here's what I want to think about. You want to think about um, taking a journey, whether it's an airplane or hiking or whatever it might be, from left to right, and that just is the way. That's just the way we read in this country, by the way. Not the same in uh, China, Japan, or Israel. There may be others too, but in this country, we read from left to right. So you want to think about going from left to right. And if you start on the left and you started going to the right, you're going to be decreasing. Good, Alexi got that. You're going to be decreasing. Are you decreasing forever? On this graph? No, definitely not. Okay, and in fact, right here, this is at negative one, you start increasing. Is that clear? Okay, so in between, in particular, negative infinity and negative one, you're decreasing. Okay, now what I want to do is I want to take away what I said before, which is now we do know math and we know calculus. What can you say about the derivative in between negative infinity and negative one? Because the derivative is not decreasing. What, what can you say about the derivative? <laughs> So what, what is the, what's, up, what's up with the derivative between negative infinity and negative one? It's negative. Yeah, it's negative. Okay, and that's actually a big theorem that if you have a differential function that is decreasing on an interval, then the derivative of that function is negative and not just then, but if and only if. So if it's decreasing, the derivative is negative. If the derivative is negative, then it must be decreasing. Okay, then between one 
and a little, uh, sorry, negative one and a little past zero. What can you say about the function first? Yeah, it's, it's increasing. And what can you say about the derivative? It's positive. Yep, and the derivative is positive. And that's kind of a corresponding theorem that says that a differential function is increasing if and only if the derivative is positive. And then if you go a little past one to, I don't know, a little two and then 2.6 or so, then you'll notice that we have a decreasing part and the derivative is negative. And then once you pass that, that, that uh, 1.6 or so, then all of a sudden the function's increasing and the derivative is positive. Okay, so I wanna put that together in words. And do you know what it means to be increasing by definition? That's a little harder or increasing, let's go increasing. So definition. f of x is increasing on, let's call it AB, if, any idea what it means to increase, to be increasing? Right? It, it's one of those that's really easy to have a feel of. You just look at it and you all know what increasing is just by looking at the graph. But let's now write down what the definition is algebraically. And that says that if A is less than, let's call it a S is less than T, is less than B. Okay, and I guess this should really be less than or equal to for the first two. Let's see if it'll let me do it. No, it didn't. So A is less than or equal to. S is less than T is less than or equal to B. Then F of S is less than F of T. And sometimes we'll say that's strictly increasing. Whereas if you don't use strictly, you can have a f of s equals f of t. Any questions on the definition? Okay, so theorem is what we just kind of saw. And that is that f of x is strictly increasing on a, b. if and only if f prime of x is greater than or equal to zero on AB. Okay, and if you get rid of the word strictly, then you get rid of the word, the equal sign and you just say greater than zero. Uh, I'm not gonna prove it. It's not that hard to prove, but I think it's pretty obvious from the from kind of looking at any picture. Do you, do you agree? Are you okay with that? Or would you rather see more theory than examples? Usually people like examples more, but again, I can do either because I know how to prove it. But while you're thinking, I'm going to write down the corresponding. Instead of increasing, we can talk about decreasing. And what changes now in this definition here? It's 
So what changes if we want to talk about decreasing instead of increasing in our definition? I don't see jumping in. It's not a trick question. Um, that's in the theorem, the F prime. But in the definition, what changes, yeah, is this greater than sign, and the less than sign becomes a greater than sign. So F of S is greater than F of T. Okay, you could also write F of T as less than F of S. Okay, and then if we want it to be strictly decreasing, if and only if F prime of X is less than or equal to zero. on AB. So it's very easy to get to decreasing once you have increasing. Okay, and it turns out the way you prove the second theorem is just multiply by negative one. Because if F is increasing, negative F is decreasing. So that's, that's the easy way, but I'm not gonna prove it because I didn't see any re request for a proof. Any questions, then you're not responsible for proving it, but I know how if you really need to see it in office hours. Any questions on this big theorem? Okay, so that, that's important. Now I wanna go back to the picture, to the graph. Okay, and let's look at this point here. Now, we, what, what is a derivative at negative one? What's f prime at negative one? Hint is it's easy. Yeah, f prime is zero. I hope you can all see that. The, the tangent line is horizontal at that point. And that means that it might be a maximum, it might be a minimum, okay? I hope you all can just look at it and tell me, is it a max or a min or neither? Yeah, this one's definitely a minimum. Let's take a look at what's going on. And what you wanna say is that what is a minimum? Minimum means that you go down, you get to that point, and after that point, you go up. Is that clear? I'm not saying anything too fancy here. But now let's turn those words into calculus. Going down is decreasing. And that means the derivative is negative on the left and the derivative is positive on the right because that's what going up means, means increasing. Any questions on that? So if you, if, you, know, you have this function, with a graph, it's really easy to see if it's a max or a min, but with an equation, it's not always so easy. And the way you can do it is you can say, well, I look and find out where the derivative is zero. And that takes some algebra sometimes. And then if you wanna find out if it's a max or a min or neither, you just go a little bit left and a little bit right and see what's going on and see what the derivative is. And if the derivative is negative on the left and positive on the right, then you know it must be a minimum. And similarly at this point here, it looks like around 0.1 or so, on the left, it is, the derivative is positive because it's going up and the right, the derivative is negative because it's going down. Any questions on that? Okay. By the way, can you have a critical point of a differential function where it's not a max and it's not a minimum? It's not a local max and it's not a local min? Can that happen? What do you think? Can you have a horizontal tangent line where you don't have a max and you don't have a minimum? Any ideas, any thoughts? Okay, I think I'm gonna change your mind. <laughs> Those who said no, because let me give an example. How about a very simple one, x cubed. What is 
what is the slope of the tangent line or the derivative at zero for x cubed? Okay, you could either do it visually or, or you could do it algebraically. Derivative x cubed is 3x squared. If you plug in zero, you get zero. So notice that y equals x cubed has a horizontal tangent line. Its derivative is zero at zero. It has a critical point. It's very differentiable. Nothing more differentiable than a polynomial. But is this a max and min or neither at the origin? What do you think? Is it a max, a min, or neither? This point right here. Yeah, this one's neither because if it were a max, that would mean that it would be the biggest of all his neighbors. But if you go a little far left, you get bigger, right? If you plug in 0 0.01, you get bigger than zero. Okay, if it were a min, then that would mean it's smaller than all your neighbors. But if you point in, point, plug in point negative 0 0.01, you get something smaller. So this is not a max, it's not a min, it's neither, even though the derivative is zero. And that's important too. So there's really three things that can happen. You can have a point like this, where it just flattens out, it's not a max and it's not a min, or you can have a minimum or you can have a maximum, okay? And we're talking about for differential functions where the derivative is zero. Any questions on that idea, kind of visually what's going on? Okay, so I can take that and I can write that as a theorem. And this is an important theorem and it has a name and this is called the first derivative test. Let me um, put that in red because it's really important. Okay, and what it says is let f of x be a differential function. near x equals c. Then three things could happen. And that's what I was trying to show you on the pictures. So number one is you can have that if just a little to the left, Okay, so on um, on a neighborhood is what we call it to the left of C. So if just to the left, you have F prime is negative. Let me just write f prime is easier. Is less than zero. And on a neighborhood, uh, you know what, I need one more thing. Be a differential function near a, x equals c with f prime of c equals zero. Otherwise, what's the point? Because if f prime of c is not zero, you don't have anything interesting. Okay, then on a neighborhood to the right of C, F prime of X is greater than zero. then f of x has 
a relative or a local. So again, now we're saying it goes down and then it goes up. So what is it? It's a local what? What kind of critical point is it? If it goes down and then up? Yeah, minimum. Add x equals c. Any questions on that? Okay. So then there's number two. And the easiest way of doing number two for me is to copy and paste. Because all I have to do is change a couple words and, and inequalities. So on a neighborhood to the left of x of c, if f prime of x is, instead of less, is greater than 0. On a neighborhood to the right, f prime is less than 0. So now it goes up, and then it goes down. And if it goes up, and then it goes down, then what do you get? Instead of a local minimum, what are we going to get? Yeah, local maximum at x equals c. OK, then third case. And the third case means that maybe it goes down and then more down. Maybe it goes up and more up. OK, any of those things that can happen. So I'm just going to write otherwise. All bets are off. OK, so in other words, if that doesn't happen, you typically don't necessarily have, you don't have a local minimum. So that means that there is no local max or min at C. Maximum or minimum. Any questions on the first derivative test? Any questions? OK, let's use it. So let's do an example. Let's suppose f of x. Is equal to x cubed minus 3x squared. So the question is, is locate and classify the critical points. Any questions on the questions? OK, notice, by the way, this is a very differential function. Polynomials are as differentiable as you get. Do you all agree? So since we have a differential function, if we want to kind of locate the critical points, what do we do? Should be an obvious question in this class. Yeah, we take a derivative. OK, I tried to pick one that's not too bad. f prime of x is equal to 3x squared minus 6x. And just for fun, because it's going to make life easier, I'm going to factor this guy. That's equal to 3x times x minus 2. Everyone OK with the algebra? OK, where are the critical points? What values of x do you get a critical point? Remember how to find critical points? Yeah, we do 0 and 2 because we set that equal to 0. And then we can say there are critical points at x equals 0 and x equals 2.
Anybody lost on that? Okay, what I have just done is I have located the critical points. Now I need to classify the critical points. So I wanna, you know, it's important to understand how to read instructions when the instructions have kind of terminology. And locate means where are the possible critical points or where are the critical points? What values of X do you have? Classify means are they max, are they min, or are they neither? So now let's classify the critical points. And what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna draw a table is the easiest way of doing it. And we have zero and two. I think that's good enough. We'll put an extra in just in case. So we're gonna have X and then we're gonna have F prime of X. So X can be, zero is important certainly, and two is important. We know that. And F prime of zero is zero and F prime of two is also zero. Any questions so far? Okay, next what we're gonna do is we're gonna say, now let's see what the derivative is to the left of zero. And by the way, when you have a differential function where the derivative is continuous, then once we're to the left of zero, it's either gonna stay positive or stay negative because it if it went from positive to negative somewhere on the left, then it would have to be zero in between somewhere. And that, see if you remember, what theorem is that? That if it goes from negative to positive, it must hit zero. That came in this class. It's been a while, that's a hint. It's not, it's not from two days ago. Yeah, that's the intermediate value theorem. So that means that all we have to do is test one value of X. You don't have to test them all, okay? And you don't have to go to like 0.0001 in, a, you know, in some small neighborhood because once you got it, it stays, that, it stays positive or it stays negative. So what's an easy value of X to the left of zero we can plug in? Yeah, how about negative one? And if you plug in negative one, I don't really care what the value is. All I care is that negative or positive. Three times negative one, and then times um, negative one minus two is positive. Again, you don't have to do the arithmetic. All you have to do is check for positive or negative because we have a positive times a negative times a negative, and that's positive. And then, if X, we need a number between zero and two, that's nice. I'm guessing you're all gonna come up with the same number. Maybe I'm wrong. Good, good, one. One is certainly the nicest number between zero and two. And again, three is positive, one is positive, one minus two is negative. So we get a negative value. And now what's a number to the, le to the right of two? Yeah, three. So three is positive, three is positive, and three minus two is positive. Positive times positive times positive is positive. Have I lost anyone? Okay, so now what we can do, if you're all following, is we can use our big theorem. So we have a critical point at x equals zero. Its derivative is negative to the, as positive to the left. It goes up on the left, goes down on the right. So what kind of critical point is this? If it goes up and then down. Yeah, it has a, I'm gonna write um, relative maximum at x equal zero and a, so now let's take a look at, at two. So now it's down on the left, 
and up on the right. If it goes down and then goes up, what is it? So what kind of critical point? So if it goes down and up, it's a relative minimum. Whoops. There it is. At x equal two. Um, by the way, are these are these global maximum min? Are they global? Yeah, definitely not. I mean, this is this is at three x squared. Uh, sorry, this is where are we? X cubed minus three x squared. All right. If x is a billion. F of X is gigantically large. A billion cubed minus three times a billion squared is, is higher than a million, okay? Whereas if X is zero, you just get zero, <laughs> okay? There's no way that zero is the maximum of this function. And similarly, if X is two, you get eight minus uh, 12, you get negative four. And if X is say ne negative a billion, you get something in the negative millions, way lower than negative four. So, f of x does not actually have any relative uh, global max or mins, but it does have relative max and a relative minimum. Any questions at all on this example? Okay. Um, if you had time and it wasn't an exam, how could you check your work? Yeah, decimals, let's do it. So x cubed minus three x squared. Let's get rid of the others. Definitely has a maximum at zero, definitely has a minimum at two. Okay, and it's definitely relative, not global. Any questions on the picture? Any questions on that? Okay, so very, very important, this first derivative test. It allows us to decide where is it a local max and where is it a local minimum. Okay, by the way, um, just for fun, I'll tell you, any guess on how I use this on Friday after class? The hint is I've already made about $3,000 because of it. Any guess? No guesses? Stock market. Okay. I saw a relative minimum on Friday and I bought a bunch of stock and I was right. Okay. I'm not always right, but I'm right more than I'm not right. And I made about $3,000 already. I haven't checked in the last half hour, but it's done very well, and I did, I, I hit just about the exact relative minimum of the stock at the time I bought it. So if you can do this financially, you can make thousands and thousands of dollars, just to let you know. The hard part, of course, on that is to know what the function is. And that takes a lot of practice and experience and, and you're not always right. But if you can be right more than you're not right, you can make literally, you know, as much money as you want. So just a note, there's money to be made in this because you want to buy at the relative minimum. And if you can sell at the relative maximum after that relative minimum, um, you can make a lot of money. So that's just one fun way of doing it. And personally, I made some money. Okay, although I haven't sold yet, I still think we're going to go up a little more. I might be wrong. But then I'll sell again. Okay, any questions on understanding this and a nice financial application? Okay. But there's lots and lots of applications, not just finances. Okay, so that is, let me show you where we are. So we just finished the first derivative. Now what we're gonna do is we're gonna move on 
and we're going to look at the second derivative. And what we want to do is want to say, well, if you, how does a second derivative help you in understanding what the graph is? Any questions on that idea? So let me take a look. I'm going to go back to this graph. Let's do the one that we're playing with, x cubed minus 3x squared. And that's, that's the function. I want to look at the second derivative. And what is the second derivative of x cubed minus 3x squared? So take two derivatives, tell me what you get. It's not that hard. Good, 6x minus 6. OK, so what we want to do is want to look at the second derivative. I want to notice something. At 0, what can you tell me about the second derivative? I'm not looking for a number, but it's, it's, it's really the sign. What's the sign of the second derivative? Not S-I-N, by the way, S-I-G-N at zero. It's not a trick question. It's negative. Good, good, good. Concave down, we'll get to. But in particular, the second derivative is negative at x equals zero. How about at x equals two? What can you tell me about the sign of the second derivative? It's positive. Okay, and I wanna let you know it's not a coincidence that we have a maximum when the second derivative is negative, and we have, a, we have a relative minimum when the second derivative is positive, okay? That turns out to always be the case. So I wanna think about the second derivative, and I have a fun function. And I wanna change the domain a bit to make it more fun. Hard with Zoom to get everything shown. I gotta do one more thing. Actually, I think I want to do one more thing. Sorry about this. It's going to take a second to graph it perfectly. Probably should have done a second guy there, but I didn't. One more time.
Yeah, that's good enough. Okay. So let's suppose, again, the big thing that's going on in the next um, Friday or so, at least uh, maybe, is the snow might be falling. Okay. And if, if all things are good and the snow falls, then we can think about possibly snowboarding, okay, or skiing or whatever you like to do. All right, now what I want to do is I want to say, imagine starting out, okay, chairlift lands you right here when x equals zero, okay? And you're going to be snowboarding or skiing. Do we have any snowboarders or skiers up here? If not, I'll be shocked since this is Tahoe, okay? So we're going to be snowboarding or skiing. And this right here is the ski run. And I want to think about the skiing or snowboarding experience. So what's happening is, how is it at the beginning? What are you feeling at the beginning of your journey coming down the hill? Is it steep? What do you think? The very beginning. Okay, the answer is not so much. Okay. Then later on, it gets steeper. Does it stay steep the whole way? All the way to, let's say, 1.5? What can you say? Does it stay steep? <coughs> okay, so take a look. I don't see all you jumping in. Okay, it looks like you grabbed here at Tahoe. Yeah, it wasn't on purpose, but maybe I did. <laughs> okay, it doesn't stay steep. Okay, it's steep, but then over here it's less steep. And in fact, you're flat right here at one, and then you're going up. Okay, and you better find a chairlift because this is not going to be fun to, to have to snowboard or ski up there unless that's what you like to do. Okay. How about the steepest point? Where do you think it is? Just eyeballing. At what value of X do you think the steepest point of the slope is of the ski run? What does it look like? Yeah, around 0.75, something like that. Maybe 0.8, I think more like 0.8, right around there. Does that make sense? So I think about 0.8 looks like the steepest. Okay, the, the derivative is not zero there. Do you all agree? It's the maximum steepness of the, of the ski run. Do you agree? Well, when you think of a maximum, you think about taking a derivative and setting it equal to zero. Isn't that what maximum, how you find a maximum? But it's not the maximum height. It's a maximum steepness. What function, what function defines steepness? The hint is it's not f of x, because we're looking at the graph of f of x. What's the function that, yeah, the derivative defines steepness. So if you want the maximum steepness, then you have to take the derivative of the steepness and set it equal to zero. The derivative of the steepness is the derivative of the derivative, which is often called the second derivative. So when the second derivative is zero, then you're at the point at which it's a maximum steepness on the curve. And that could be steepness going up, or it could be steepness going down, either direction, because there's also a maximum steepness over here somewhere at around 1.2. Do you see that? Okay, but that's the steepness going up. But either way, you're gonna say the second derivative is zero at those points. The word we use for that, for those points are inflection points. And I'll write this out in a minute. 
but I want to kind of show you pictorially because I think it's the easiest way to understand it, is the inflection points are the points at which the, we're, we're going from getting steeper and steeper to less steep and less steep, or going from not so steep to much steeper, okay? So that is called an inflection point. If you look at if you look at by one, just kind of look at this little area near one. And if I if I dropped water there, what's going to happen to that water near one? Right, it's going to rain now, or and what's going to happen to the rain? Yeah, we're going to get a big puddle. Do y'all see that? So if you're near one, you're gonna get a puddle. We call that shape where you get that kind of puddle, concave up. On the other hand, if you're closer to zero and it rains, it's not gonna have a puddle at all. It's just gonna like move off of it. And that's called concave down. Any questions on that? Now you can define it mathematically by the second derivative. It's concave up. What do you think? Do you think the second derivative is positive or negative at one? What do you think? One more guess. So the, the second derivative, yeah, sorry, second derivative is, pos is positive. I didn't mean to trick you. I was reading the wrong thing. So the second derivative is positive at one, okay? So it's concave up if the second derivative is positive and it's concave down if the second derivative is negative. So let's put all that in words. So now it's time for some definitions. So I've kind of shown you a picture. Now it's time to actually write it out. So definition. And the first thing is let x be a twice differentiable function. Okay, if you can't take two derivatives, then we don't even talk about it. So it's a twice differential function, then, and there's gonna be three cases. If f double prime of x is less than zero, then the uh, function or the graph is concave down and two, let's just copy and paste because it's easier and change what we need to. If f double prime is greater than zero, then the graph is concave up. And three, now we're gonna be looking at, it could be that F double prime is zero. I guess I need an if. F double prime of X equals zero. And it changes sign from the left to the right, then there is an inflection point there. Let me um, put, put it in red because it's really important. So inflection point.
Any questions? Any questions on this? And then the theorem, we did all this with the graph. Today isn't a proof day. I decided not to do proofs. I always want to show you stuff, do examples, and then give you the language. Okay. And the theorem is that let f prime of x, f prime um, at c, equals zero. So let's suppose we have a let's suppose we have a critical point. Then, and there's going to be three cases. First is if f double prime is less than zero. So if f double prime of x is less than zero, what kind of critical point do you think it is? And it could be a C. So if f double prime is less than zero, and I showed you the picture, then what kind of what what's what kind of critical points do you have? While you're thinking, I'm gonna put in this is called the second derivative test. Then there is a, I'll start you off, relative what? Shouldn't be too bad. Yeah, it's a maximum. So if f double prime is less than zero, then we have a relative maximum. Let me, let me give you a suggestion. If you have trouble remembering these criteria, let me write down the other one as I talk. So if you have trouble remembering these criteria, think of an easy, the easiest example there is. What's the easiest example that has um, a max or a min? What's the easiest example that has a, a minimum, for example? It's the easiest function that has a minimum. When I say it, it'll make sense. Any ideas? Y equals X squared. Don't you agree that's the easiest function that has a minimum? It's a parabola. It's the easiest parabola there is. Um, you could try lines, but lines don't have max and mins. So parabola is the next hope. So notice the derivative of the second derivative of x squared is two, and that's positive. It has a min, so that means it has a minimum. And we know that y equals x squared, just from the picture, it's a parabola, standard parabola has a minimum. So if you don't remember, just plug in x squared and that'll remind you whether you need a, a positive or negative. So x squared has a minimum and the second derivative is positive. Okay, three. And that is what's left. Yeah, if f double prime of c equals zero, then the test fails. So I, we learned nothing. Use the first derivative test. Okay, the first derivative test always works, but sometimes, but it's usually messier in terms of, you know, working stuff out because you got to plug in, you got to look for positive and negatives. Um, the second derivative test is often really simple, but if you end up with a zero, then it didn't work, and then you got to use the first derivative test. Any questions? Okay, just quickly. 
we look at um, our example that we had before. Where was it? Ah, here it is. And we can say f double prime of x was equal to 6x minus 6. Any questions on that? Very simple. And notice that f double prime of, of zero is equal to negative six, which is certainly less than zero. Okay, that, this is not hard. So by the second derivative test, there is a local relative max. at x equals zero. And similarly, if you plug in two, six times two is 12 minus six is six. So f double prime of two was positive six, which is greater than zero. So now by the second derivative test, there is a relative minimum. At x equals two. What looked easier by the way, the first derivative test or the second derivative test on this example? which seemed easier. Yeah, the second and second derivative test is usually easier. But if fa if it fails then you're stuck and you got to do the first. Okay, any questions at all? Any questions at all on the second derivative test? Any second? Any questions? Okay, let me do one more example. We have a few more minutes, not too many more minutes, but we have a little bit. That's all there is. Let's suppose, let f of x equal, let's say um, x plus the cosine, I'm uh, sorry, um, Let's go twice the cosine of x. Okay, you may have you may have a smaller idea of you know what this sucker looks like. So, but we can still do it. And the question is, is let's locate and classify the extrema. And you can graph it also if you want. So notice that f prime of x. is equal to one minus two sine of x. Everyone okay with that? Let's set, set that to be zero. Okay, what do you get? What is x? And I'll let you go between zero and two pi. So x, so that tells you, by the way, the sine of x is a half. And the sine of x is a half 
when x is equal to pi over six, or five pi over six. Any questions on that? Okay. Now, you know, most of you, it might be a little tough to kind of come up with whether it's positive or negative, close to the left or right. Um, sac let's try the second derivative test and see if we, if it, we get lucky and it works. So let's do it. So f double prime of x. What's f double prime of x? Y'all better be able to tell me. Yeah, negative two cosine of x. Okay. And now we could plug in. So if we're looking at f double prime of pi over six, That's negative two times the cosine of pi over six. And again, you don't have to know exactly what it is, but is it positive or is it negative? Yeah, this is less than zero. So that means we have a relative. So what is it? Max or min? Yeah, relative max. Okay, then I could do the same thing with five pi over six. Now, the cosine of five pi over six, five pi over six is in quadrant two. The cosine is negative in quadrant two. So negative two times the negative is positive. Any questions on that? So we get a relative minimum. Okay, at that value. And by the way, if you want to know the y coordinate, you just plug in. So at um, x equals pi over six, that's going to be pi over six plus two times the square root of three over two, whatever that number is. And at five pi over six, same idea. Five pi over six plus two times um, negative the square root of three over two. Okay, any questions? Any questions on using or applying the second derivative test or the first derivative test? And we can graph it. Um, once you know where you have the max and mins, then you just plot. You plot the points. You know it, it's a, a max. So that means you draw a, a little kind of parabola looking thing at that point, an upside down parabola. Minimum, you draw a little po positive parabola connect the dots and you can get a nice graph out of that. Okay, and that's how you graph. Okay, um, we're about out of time. I'm looking at the clock, just about right. So I'm gonna stop the recording.